Hello and welcome back to Grassroots Crypto, where I like to teach people about crypto. And this video will be my first video on ThoughtPi, where I'll be talking about synthetics. Um, it's been a much requested video and I'm looking forward to uh, sharing this information with you. Synthetics are not the easiest thing to understand. It's one of those things where you look at the spec and you're like, oh, I think I get it. And then you like look at it for another five minutes and then you realize you don't. So um, if you don't get it first time around, that's fine. Um, do, we're just gonna take some time to go through it um, in a very progressive uh, way. The format of this video is gonna be, uh, we're gonna go over some revision, then we're gonna go through some general synthetic concept like overview, then some more details and summarize that. And then in the next video, I'm gonna be going through um, a lot more examples of how the synthetics work, the impacts on the pool, um, why it has a slip discount and um, lots of other details. So I've deliberately broken it up into two videos, this one being the overview and get that general basic understanding and the next one going through specific examples, which is based off a recent uh, tweet by Thorchain. Um, so it's not to overload one video with too much information. go to um, the Docs store chain, there's not much information on synthetics. Um, they have links to two of the um, issues here, and this is uh, the feature for synthetic assets. And to be honest, like I've read this quite a few times, there's not huge amounts of detail here. Um, anyway, this is the actual synthetic spec. There's one on the savings account, or um, kind of called the, the synthetic vault. That has a bit of information in there as well, but I wouldn't say huge amounts. I did find a, um, a nice little uh, website here that has a bit more information on it. Just, um, I like the graphics, so I thought I'd show that as well. So I have gone ahead and created some of my own graphics so we can go through this. Starting with some revision, which um, actually some of it I may not have covered before. So when we have a liquidity pool, we have Rune and an asset, so e.g. BDC. So that makes up the liquidity pool itself. It's always two assets and Rune's always one of them. Um, when you add, as a liquidity provider, when you add liquidity, you have a share of that pool or known as redemption rights on it. Um, anyway, that share is, is calculated in liquidity units. So if you go to like BepSwap or, or assume ThorSwap and you have a look at your um, liquidity position and what you've added, then it'll say, oh, these, you have these amount of liquidity units. And that essentially is a position or a percentage of the pool that you have redemption rights of. So as an example, if I have a pool here um, of a depth of $2 million where BDC is worth 40,000, and I know it's not, it's just example, and room price is $10, then one BDC buys um, 4,000 rune, that's the ratio. If I had 100,000 here of rune and 25 BDC, overall that'd be a million dollars this side, a million dollars that side. So that's a $2 million depth pool. If I was a liquidity provider and I added 4,000 rune and one BDC, I would have added $80,000. And that would be my ownership, 4% of ownership of the pool, and that would be calculated in liquidity units. So what I'm trying to, um, uh, explain here is liquidity units is a way of saying the percentage or the ownership of the pool and that directly translates to so many rune and so many BDC. And that does change because of if the ratio changes due to price movements, permanent loss, whatever. Um, so that, that does change that ratio. So, you know, the exact, you wouldn't necessarily get 4,000 rune and one BDC. It might be a little bit differently depending on price movements, but essentially that's what your liquidity units mean when you're looking inside of a pool. So now we know what liquidity units are, we can look at it at a different way. Liquidity units essentially means a certain amount of BDC or a certain amount of rune, or a certain amount of asset and rune inside of a pool. This is our BDC pool. So BDC pool, rune and asset equals liquidity units. And for a simple pool, pretty much if you add up all of the liquidity, all the liquidity would be assigned to liquidity providers, um, and that would be liquidity units. Um, that's without sense. Maybe there's some reserve in the pool as well, but uh, too much detail. So how does sense work? We've talked about um, liquidity units being sort of underpinned or, or represent 
uh, uh, an ownership or proportion of the pool. Then we have dynamic liquidity units and that essentially underpins um, or is the collateral for, um, or represents the collateral for, it's probably a better way of putting it, uh, the synthetic asset. So this would be like synthetic BDC represented as floor.bdc as an example here. So essentially what I'm trying to say is that the synthetic asset is collateralized, backed by, or whatever you want to call it, by Rune and BDC. And what I don't want to get confused is, it's not like this, where it is just like purely backed by BDC in the pool. It's backed by both assets via these um, liquidity units. And these liquidity units are very different to um, these because these are owned by liquidity providers, whereas these are going to be owned by the protocol. Um, and I'll talk more about that um, um, as we go through. So this is a shorthand way of writing the exact same thing. Um, synthetic asset is essentially a part of the pool. I can't really say percentage of the pool, but it is um, a part of the pool. Uh, that's just, again, shorthand way of writing that, meaning that it is, because pools are made up of Rune and BDC, it is essentially backed or collateralized by both assets here, not just one. Um, so then we go to minting. So how do we create? This is essentially creating. So when, when we create, we put Rune in and to um, a pool. So just pretend this is the BDC pool. And then we get synthetic BDC out. This is essentially like a swap. And really the formula is the swap formula just with different letters. Um, so we put Rune in, we get synthetic BDC out. That's how it works. Um, and that synthetic BDC will then live on the Thorchain blockchain. Uh, then if we wanted to go from BDC, so this is native layer one BDC, through to synthetic BDC, it would go through BDC through to Rune, and then Rune would go across and then create the synthetic BDC. So minting or creating synthetic assets is always done with Rune. Um, and, you know, to, to go from a layer one through to a synthetic, it would go through Rune here. And this is like the double swap process. Uh, normally, if you're swapping Ethereum directly to BDC or Ethereum to Litecoin, it would go through Rune like this. Then we have redeeming. So this is when we want to um, take a synthetic BDC and redeem it. So it's always done, the redemption's always done with Rune. And again, this is essentially a swap, it's the same formula. Um, where we're swapping synthetic BDC for Rune, we're actually not doing that. We're, we're burning synthetic BDC and then getting the collateral value for it um, in Rune. It's probably more formally the, the better way of saying that. Um, and if we wanted to go basically the reverse of this process, we wanna go from synthetic BDC back to our layer one BDC, uh, we would take our synthetic BDC into the pool that would give us Rune and then we take that put that into um, the pool again and then swap. Dude, that's actually a swap. So this is a layer one swap. This is a redemption, um, it's a bit different. So then we would swap Rune for BDC. Uh, just over here, this is a, a, a normal swap. And then this is a mint uh, specifically. So that's how we would do it. Um, and these are just, again, a bit of an overview to get yourself comfortable with the idea of how this um, type of process works. To swap a synthetic BDC to synthetic Ethereum, we would go through um, synthetic BDC to Rune. So this would be essentially a redemption. And then we go through Rune to synthetic Ethereum, and this is essentially a minting. So a redemption and a mint would then be a synthetic swap. Now, I did wanna say, Actually, in all of these processes, these more complicated processes here that kind of look like a dub swap, but they're not. This can be done by, you know, graphical user interfaces. So it's very seamless, just kind of like how full swap works now when you're going from asset to asset, even though ruins the settlement uh, asset underneath, uh, it, it can make it all seamless. So it doesn't look as complicated as this. Next is the synth vault, which um, we, I showed the spec for uh, just before. And this, to give a very, very high level, this is like the Rune Vault um, kind of thing where you can grab your synth that you've minted, put that into the synthetic vault, and that earns interest. Probably just leaving a lot of the detail out there, but essentially you can take, you know, 10 synth, put it into a vault, and then earn 12 synth as an example. Okay, you know, a lot of things are dependent on there and 
There's lots of number crunching to go about it, but that's essentially what it does is then you're just holding the synthetic. You don't have to worry about it's being like a normal liquidity provider. So it simplifies things because synthetics, when they get minted, don't earn anything. They just sit there. Um, whilst the, the, the protocol will honor the redemption value, it won't earn interest. It won't gain value. It won't decrease value, but it will just sit there. Whereas the synth vault is a way to earn interest on that synth to grow the value of that synthetic. So that's just a general overview of um, synthetics, like a very conceptual without going into too much detail. But I did want to spend um, a bit of time uh, covering off a few details to set up the, the next video. So let's talk about minting, collateral and redemption. We're going to be doing some minting and then we're going to go do some redeeming. So this is just basically I'm going rune to synthetic BDC, then taking that synthetic BDC and then um, redeeming that pretty much straight away. Or there might be a time period in there, you know, let's say I've sent it to the vault for six months and earn some interest and then I'm redeeming it, whatever. So what's actually happening here? If I put 10 rune in, this is the collateral I've added in order to generate this synth or to mint the synth. Uh, so step one would be I add the rune and then the rune is essentially, because it's arbed out in the pool, um, it is then held within the pool as both asset and rune. So it's added as 100% add as rune, then held as both assets to collateralize what's backing the synth here. And this would be 4.9 or whatever, it wouldn't exactly be five. Uh, don't worry about the numbers, I kind of just made them up. Um, and then when you redeem it over here, it's redeemed in rune. So it is collateral is given in rune, held in both assets and then redeemed in rune. That's just like a little bit of, um, I think an important subtlety to note um, with, with regards how things, the difference between minting collateral and redemption. So how collateral is stored. So going, looking at the pool in a bit more detail, um, when, we, when we look at liquidity units, these are liquidity units or the liquidity that liquidity providers have provided and they have redemption rights for. So they're, they're stored completely separate to the, the collateral that's been provided for the synthetic. And just, you can think of them as very separate. And there's a formula here. So pool units, exactly. The overall liquidity in the pool is the synth units, which is kind of a different way of saying synth collateral. Um, just trying to you know keep low on the detail here so it's essentially the synth units or the synth collateral plus liquidity units so what that means um another way of saying that is that when when synths are minted the overall depth of the pool increases but the liquidity the overall liquidity units will not really increase so we'll run through that um um in a different in a different video in the next video but what I'm trying to explain here is that the liquidity units and the, the collateral for the synth are held separately and accounted for separately. And essentially Thorchain owns this liquidity, um, whereas liquidity providers own this liquidity and they're, they're held separately. So next, the big question, why no impermanent loss? So I've got this quote from Lena, um, which we'll break down. Synths are not subject to impermanent loss simply because the protocol honors the redemption value of the collateral not the units behind them, which actually changes dynamically. So that's what I meant by dynamic liquidity units above. So let's have a look at what that means. So if we've got our pool here, and this is a start position of what I was talking about over here. If there's a contraction of the pool or the pool loss, so it, it shrinks in size, just so there's a very large amount of impermanent loss. What's interesting is the synthetic collateral won't change. So it doesn't contract in the same way as liquidity units do. So in this scenario, the, the, you know, the synth holder doesn't lose out, but liquidity providers will. And just a note on impermanent loss, like this is a nice little graph I got off the internet um, from this location. So if the price stays the same, there's no impermanent loss, but if it increases, there is, and particularly if it starts to decrease, particularly a lot, the permanent loss kind of goes off this big cliff, you know, like 20%, 50% loss, and that's how much your, your asset's worth. So um, little bits of change from permanent loss, okay, huge amounts are bad, but that's not the case for um, synthetic providers because the protocol honors the redemption value. 
Right, so just understand here that the pull loss that I just explained is one side. We've got to get to what happens if the pull grows, and I'll dig into that um, a little, little bit more, so don't get too scared for the moment. But I wanted to talk about like how this all works and go through the, I guess, the risk chain and how risk is then transferred or managed um, as a liquidity provider under this scenario. So the redemption value, and I, I like to think of it as a fixed redemption value because um, it doesn't it doesn't actually increase or decrease uh, depending on what the pool's doing is backed by the liquidity providers. The liquidity providers are then backed by a 100-day impermanent loss protection, which is then backed or underpinned by the ThorChain protocol itself. So in a way, indirectly, the ThorChain protocol is backing itself um, by fixing the redemption value. However, it goes through the liquidity providers and then to 100-day impermanent loss protection. And if you're not sure about 100-day impairment loss protection, see my video um, on this that explains, you know, how that all works. Um, but it's, yeah, essentially, if you're a liquidity provider and you've been in for 100 days or more, providing liquidity and you haven't changed or updated your, your liquidity, then you should be at no loss, even though liquidity providers have essentially, I don't want to say paid for, but um, provided the additional liquidity to, to ensure the fixed redemption value here. Over on the right-hand side, that's just another way of saying it. Um, the redemption value is backed by liquidity providers, which is underpinned by a 100-day impairment loss protection, which is then underpinned by the reserve. So indirectly, the reserve is ensuring that happens um, for when liquidity providers are in the protocol for 100 days. So let's look at this in a bit more detail. Oh, and, and that's why there's no impermanent loss because the impermanent loss essentially, um, the, the, the synth collateral is essentially fixed with regards to what the redemption will be. That's why there's no impermanent loss. It doesn't really care. It's always gonna like guarantee the, the, the redemption value there. So then we've got a pull start, pull loss, pull gains. Let's have a look. So in all cases, um, regardless of what the pool is doing, the synth collateral or the redemption value is gonna be the same. So um, under a contraction that obviously the liquidity providers are gonna lose out, which we talked about. However, um, under a gain or an expansion, the liquidity providers are going to be doing um, significantly better than the, the synth holder that's doing nothing with their synthetics. And if you were to think of this as 33% of the, um, it would have to be pool units, and then that 66% of the pool units, the liquidity um, providers are essentially at two times leverage com in comparison to the synth collateral because if it if it contracts they're going to have twice or uh, you know two times loss if it uh, increases they're going to have two times gains compared to the, the uh, synth collateral there so um it's like yeah it's like being on a two times leverage if if that was that ratio you can look at it that way and think about well uh, you know i'm paying for the synth collateral and all that type of thing i think you know, that's perhaps one way of looking at it. I would also look at it, if I'm a liquidity provider and I just want to be a liquidity provider, then nothing really changes um, if cents are there or not there. It's just that, you know, you'd only have that understanding because if you watch this video or if you look at the, the pool picture and a holistic point of view. So I wouldn't get too worked up about it because being a liquidity provider now um, doesn't really change uh, being a liquidity provider when synthetics have added. Um, if you want to, you know, be in there for a hundred days or more. Just trying to explain why there is no impairment loss and the fact that liquidity providers cover that impairment loss, but they also enjoy their protection. Fees, lastly, I just want to get on to uh, fees. So for assets in, for when we swap assets in and, and the assets come out, these are like layer one native assets. There's no change in the fees. So see my video on fees here and this is my video on impairment loss protection so see these two videos for more information on those two subjects so the asset in um, and asset out there's no change to the fee so asset in one times transaction fee asset out three times transaction fee um, except for rune because rune runs on the full chain blockchain it is a set fee so the synthetics in will be 0.02 transaction cost of rune and synth out is the same a synth swap is inbound plus outbound fee. And just to show you this picture here, which is a video I actually recorded, but 
I was too excited for synths to get it out. So all the synths run on the four chain blockchain here, and that's why they get the 0.02 fee because that is fixed inside of constants here. So 0.02 fee on all swaps and withdrawals and on-chain transactions here. So I hope that gives you a really good understanding um, about synthetics at a, at a conceptual level. There's probably more questions you're gonna have. We're gonna run through more um, examples, looking at the impact of the pools, looking at the impact of swaps. Um, in this, this next video they're gonna do, uh, we're gonna be looking at a lot of the number crunching and how that all works and stuff like that. Um, this video is just designed to give you a basic understanding of full chain synthetics as well as why there's no um, impermanent loss, as well as how um, collateral is moved around and accounted for within within Fortune. So it's just I've just got a few notes here, um, just to summarise on um, a few things about uh, about the synthetics. The synthetics are backed by um, Rune as well as an asset within the pool, not just the asset itself. Since have a much reduced transaction fee. Um, as compared to like the layer one assets, which we just covered off um, here. Since do not um, earn interest or, or earn any return by itself. However, it can be put into the vault to earn interest. The collateral of the synths over here is owned by the protocol itself. And since they're not subject to impermanent loss because of the way the protocol fixes the redemption value, um, and that's underpinned by liquidity providers, which is obviously then they are protected by the impairment loss protection. Uh, that is about it for the video. Um, let me know what you think about this, what questions you have on something that's been covered. Um, as I said in the next video, we're gonna go into more detail, look at the pool impacts, run through some examples, and I think that would help make sense and go through some details that kind of, I just can't cover off here. Um, and then hopefully by the time you get to that video, we have a good understanding of this. So let me know if you have any specific comments on anything I've covered so far um, in the comments. If you like the video, hit the big thumbs up, subscribe to see more content like this, to see the next video. And um, I look forward to your feedback and response. And until next time, thanks and goodbye.